In today's video, we're going to start exploring the different clans that make up the Skaven faction. Because the army we understand as Skaven is so vast and diverse, it's hard to talk about as a whole. We have to break it up a little bit. And as we explored in yesterday's video, the great clans rule their society. Think of them as these massive gangs all focused on very specific things. Within each great clan is smaller factions, smaller clans, usually given the name of whoever's leading it. But all of these clans are vying for control, more seats of power on the council. And the culture of each Skaven clan or great clan is different and we're going to explore them all. What's important to kind of call back to is the fact that we can't ever leave kind of the base area. And that is to say that all of these things, no matter what we're talking about, is comprised and built upon the base Skaven that we talked about yesterday. That kind of selfish cowardice in fighting always thinks that they're the most important kind of creature. But even within that, their view of the Great Horned Rat is different, and therefore their expression of that worship is different. How they conduct themselves, how they fight their battles, how they show dominance and superiority to one another is all very different. And so today, it's going to be a longer one, but we're going to talk about Clans Scryer. And I just want to reiterate, there are hundreds and thousands of clans that make up the Clans, plural, Scryer. Each one of them has the same focus, but they are collectively called the Clan Scryer. And one note I want to put up here up front is that there is actually very little art for the units that we're going to talk about today. So as I will be showing you pictures of the unit, like the actual model that Games Workshop produces for each of the units we discussed today, in between those you will see art for other things that are sort of less relevant. Bear with me, there's limited amounts of art, but there's a lot of lore. And since I'm not an artist myself, I can't just make it up. Fundamentally, the Skavens that make up the clan's scryer see the Great Horned Rat as the great innovator. A creature of impossible intelligence. Uses remarkable cunning and innovation to dominate the realms. As Skavens seek to imitate and please the Great Horned Rat, they focus on powerful war machine, dark sciences, weapons, mechanics, techno sorcery. Their vision is to rule the Skaven race and also the realms with unstoppable machines that demonstrate their intelligence and when that is going to see them through. Now a brief history lesson here, during the uh, near the end of the Realm Gate Wars, which is the big kind of cataclysmic campaign that brought us to where we are now, where the gates of Azir opened and the forces of order were trying to repopulate the realms. Well at that time there were two clans that were really dominant. Clans Pestilence and Clans Scryer. And you can check out this very lengthy series I have about Pestilence in one of my Skaven playlists. But at the time when the Realm Gate Wars were ending, Pestilence had the most military might. They owned the most land. They got attained this through traveling with Nurgle forces during the Realm Gate Wars. But Scryer was powerful for a different reason because its power was more monetary. They are adept at producing and selling weapons, developing technologies for the home front. And there was this very kind of precarious balance where you have the Council of Thirteen, which of course is just made up of 12 chairs, one honorary, one for the Great Horned Rat, and two of the clans are really in their kind of ascendancy, vying for control. And that all changed when the Necroquake happened, when Nagash tried to seize ultimate control and he just kind of warped the way magic works. Well, this huge shockwave went out. If you haven't read the book Soul Wars, we see the effects of this on Azir. It just levels huge portions of the realm of the heavens. Well, even though it's kind of in between realms, the Necroquake still rocked Blight City. Entire sections of the city were collapsed. Again, it's built on this crude scaffolding. All it took was this push and the house of cards went toppling down. Well, several council members of the Skaven race were dead or missing, and there was complete anarchy and disarray. Every clan used the chaos to try and seize power from their peers. And I don't just mean the great clans trying to seize power on the council itself. I mean, even within the drama of the minor clans that make up the larger ones, everyone tried to use this incident as a way to get control of their power base. The council, as of the time of recording in the current lore, completely up to date, is a mess, with Pestilence and Scryer ready to go for an all-out civil war to attain total control. And again, that is the current state of Skaven leadership and Scryer's position within it. But the book says something else. 
While Pestilence was out conquering Guran with Nurgle, Scryer was stockpiling the most devastating weapons they have. And there are some who speculate that using gnaw holes and kind of different types of optics, they were actually able to see inside Azir and knew what Sigmar had coming. And so they've been working in the background to accrue these incredible war machines and get their armaments ready for when Azir finally broke open. Regardless, they have stockpiled arcane weapons at an insane rate. And so with that, the Battle Tome kind of introduces us to the temperament of the clan's scryer. That they are armed to the teeth. They are incredibly powerful, wealthy, and able to manipulate large portions of Skaven society. They are poised to seize control of pretty much the entire race and ready to fight against anything that comes at them. I thought that history lesson kind of bringing you up to present in terms of, I guess, Skaven politics, if you can call it that, was really important. One, to give you an idea of where Scryer's at, but also to kind of as an addendum to where Pestilence is at. And so that fundamentally is what Clan Scryer is. Focus on technology, arcane weapons, things like that. But we're going to transition now to talk about some units. And there are many units within the Clan's Scryer, and I want to touch on a whole lot of them. Keep in mind, there are several things here with varying amounts of lore, but all of them, regardless, integrate the following themes. Engineering, machinery, technology, design, and intelligence. To gain precision and prestige within the clan scryer is to be extremely intelligent. To innovate or refine the most terrifying weapons of war. You have to also be able to survive the numerous assassination attempts and plots of your peers. And the things that they create are also very distinctive because all their machinery is so crude in nature. It's all cobbled together from the refuse of other societies. Powered by warp stone or in some cases refined realm stone. And there's a really great story in the Battle Tome about a council member named Scratch. Who rose from being an acolyte to an engineer all the way to being a council representative for clans scryer which is huge i mean that's momentous of the trillions he was one of the council members he did this because he found a way to refine chemonite the realm stone of the realm of metal into a more devastating weapon for doom wheels and things like that but going back to what all the machines are like one important feature you'll see again and again and again is the idea that they are just as likely to hurt the people using them as they are the enemies they are pointed at. But there are big rewards for creating impressive war machines. These are, these are dark contraptions of terror that have no business moving, but they do so with horrific results, slaughtering and destroying their enemies. So again, that's pretty universal across everything we're going to talk about, but they are really fun things to explore. And what I'm going to do is actually start at the top of the pyramid, if you will, and work my way down. They don't really have like a, uh, a teeming masses unit like uh, clan rats or anything like that. So I'm just going to start with the most notable characters and kind of branch my way out. And of course, that starts off the conversation with the Arch Warlock. This is the head of any clan scryer. Right, if your clan is a clan scryer clan, <laughs> it, it will have that. Usually it'll be named after the Arch Warlock or something like that. And this guy is a master inventor. He has made his mark in Skaven society through engineering, but also through surviving the countless assassination and sabotage attempts. A smaller clan may be led by a single arch warlock, and larger ones can have this entire like cabal of them all working together on various projects. And regardless of that, they seek to raise the stature of their particular clan. And leadership in this kind of context means a few things. You have to survive the foils of your underlings, meaning all the engineers, warlock engineers beneath you are trying to get you killed or dishonored so they can take your place. At the same time, you have to push them to create bigger and more destructive weapons because it makes your clan greater. At the same time, you can't let them get too good. Right, if someone designs a better version of, say, a Doom Wheel or some other kind of war machine, you want to take those plans and kill him so this way it looks like you did it. So you want everyone to do their best but not get too great that they gain too much notoriety. And they're also a key part of the clan's scryer affluence. We mentioned before that they are extremely wealthy, they have a large power base on the home front, stockpiles of weapons, and the Arch Warlocks are directly responsible for that. They make the deals that see their war machines used in other 
clans. If you can think of them sort of as a, a CEO of a manufacturing firm, a team manager, warlord, and mad scientist, all kind of crammed into one. And with this wealth and affluence, they're of course able to get the most impressive armor and weapons around. And one weapon that they are very famous for is the Warp Power Accumulator. And what it does is it takes the natural magics occurring around them, kind of spins it up to hyperspeed on their back and launches it at the enemy. And what that does when it leaves the barrel, if you will, is it creates this devastating dark lightning that fries enemies anywhere near them. Now directly beneath the Arch Warlock are a kind of a large team of Warlock engineers. There are several types of engineering a Skaven can get into, and you think of things like explosives and chemical engineering and vehicles, warp weapons, rattling guns, that kind of stuff. And Warlock engineers exist to explore them all to terrifying degrees. Like I said, this is the rank directly below Arch Warlock, and a clan will of course have several Warlock engineers each one wielding devastating weapons of their own design. And this truly is the game, right? Uh, to prove your expertise, survive your peers and your supervisor, remember he wants to quash you because he can't let you get too good, develop weapons of war. And most of the drama and infighting for leadership happens at this level, just because there are more Skaven here than at the top. One of the more specific types of Warlock Engineers is the Warlock Bombardier. And this is a new unit we got with the Battle Tome. Came, the model itself came in the Carrion Empire set originally. And this is a Warlock Engineer who focuses on the use of guided explosives. They'll build a super unstable rocket, mount it to a pole, fire some warp energy through the pole arm, and it'll set the rocket towards the enemy. In theory, of course and they can overcharge the weapon for even more devastation. However, things can easily go awry. What could be a small hero with the best gun on the battlefield, which is what they kind of are, can just as easily be an unarmored rat exploding next to a missile. You take the good with the bad. But as of to date, that is the only like specific type of warlock engineer we have. Now that's like middle management kind of, and below them are sort of the basic clan's scryer troops. Now that is going to be the scryer acolytes. All right, the next tier down. See, while the engineers come up with the plans, the acolytes see them through. They're responsible for everything from uh, managing the slaves, actually doing the construction. They're responsible for testing things, tinkering, collecting equipment and resources to get it done. Think of them as, I guess, the interns, if you will who see the plans of their superiors come together. A, little, a lot more hands-on, if you will. They don't have the luxury of being in charge and sitting back while the battle's going on. They have to be, actually get in there and do the work. And that carries through when a battle erupts, where instead of having even lower minions do the fighting for them, of course they can't, they're at the bottom of the totem pole in the clan scryer, they'll go ahead and don these gas masks and breathing apparatuses, and they're gonna chuck these glass spheres full of warp fumes, right? Think of a, a gaseous state of warp stone, and it poisons and suffocates the enemy mid-battle. It's an incredible weapon, and the book makes it very clear. It's very easy and highly probable that you're going to drop and break one of these things by accident, so you'll kind of nuke the unprotected clan rats around you. Now, I will say that is probably it for the kind of base Skaven who are just kind of working their way up the hierarchy. Everything else we're going to talk about here is either a war machine, a tool of war, or something much, much darker. And when I say darker, I'm talking about the Storm Fiends. One of the most gruesome creations of the Clan Scryer. And it also demonstrates an aspect of Skaven economy. As we'll talk about later, Clans Molder are the flesh crafters. They're able to create these horrific beasts uh, used as living war engines. One of which, and certainly the most predominant, is the Rat Ogre. It's very easy to see why you could perceive him as like a living war engine. He's just a hulking beast. And we're gonna dive more into him in the actual dedicated Molder video. Well, what the Clan Scryer did to create Storm Fiends was they bought a whole bunch of baby Rat Ogres, if you will. They put those babies in a vat and then pumped them full of warpstone power. And this made them grow rapidly and even bigger than you know, kind of a basic rat ogre. These things are massive. And when that creature is grown, it's augmented with every manner of weapon available. It's got warp fire projectors, rattling cannons, shock gauntlets, anything and everything to make them terrifying. 
large armor plates are grafted to their skin, and with this they can wreak horror on the enemy from afar or up close. But that's not actually where it ends, and that's not what makes them so devastating and gruesome and disgusting. That just makes them really good at what they do. See, the basic issue with a rat ogre is that they are extremely dumb. They are huge and strong and powerful, but they lack the cunning and intelligence that a Skaven typically has. And you can't go giving an armament like this to a creature that dumb. So intelligence matters, right? It's either not going to work, or it's going to do the wrong thing and shoot up your own guys and you've gotten nowhere. So Scryer did some experiments of their own on the Skaven form and came up with something that is truly disgusting and amazing at the same time. They came up with this thing called the Brain Skaven. What you do is you modify a normal Skaven to be nothing but an external brain for the Storm Fiend. This rat's body shrivels after months of disuse, but his mind is plugged into the Storm Fiend through cables and connections. He becomes the Storm Fiend, a colossus amongst his peers, and a god on the battleground. It's this horrific fusion of two creatures with a whole bunch of technology bolted on. It's dark, it's nasty, and I love it. Now the next unit we want to talk about here is the Warp Lightning Cannon. This is the siege weapons of the Clan Scryer, first designed by the engineers of the Ashbark Voltic Engine Coven. They supercharge a huge hunk of warp stone and then channel that power through a rune-laden barrel directed at the enemy. And the effect is immediate. The whole world around you turns green. The hair on every nearby Skaven stands up straight. And while the projectile is too fast to follow with your eyes, it leaves this sickly green trail that you can't miss. And it leads to an incredible explosion. Now, next I want to talk about my personal favorite Skaven unit, and that is the Doom Wheel. Certainly one of the most iconic units in the entire army, and it really embodies all of Skaven technology. This is a crudely built and piloted war machine of death and ruin, oftentimes just as much to Skaven as it is to the enemy. It's basically a giant hamster wheel that's been armed to the teeth, an inner wheel with a few slaves running in it to move it, an engineer on the back to steer and fire the weapons, the motion of the device itself powers up the warp stone generator, which then fires out huge gouts of warp lightning in front of it at the enemy. When it all goes well, this is a true tornado on the battlefield. It is a thing of perpetual motion, crushing enemies, blasting away any survivors. It's like a runaway train covered in howitzers with a bunch of maniacally laughing crew aboard. But, as you can see by looking at it, it has a lot of, we'll call them points of failure. Maybe the crew die and the machine slows down to a crawl. It doesn't take much to hit those slaves. Maybe the generator stops working, so it loses its primary weapon. Or maybe the wheel gets jammed and it runs over other Skaven, like it gets stuck going perpetually right by accident. Something goes wrong mechanically with it. Or, maybe, the whole thing just explodes, killing everyone around it. Both the devastating success of this weapon and the crippling failure of having it blow up in your face are equally possible outcomes for this. And that really is what I mean when I say it's a defining feature of Skaven technology. It tends to do more damage to the enemy than it does to us, therefore it must be great and is reliable. Now after the Doom Wheel is the Gisales, a classic unit that retains an immense presence on the table, and this is truly just a sniper team by any other name. They have massive long barrel rifles. It requires two Skaven to operate, because it is just so massive. And they fire off these rounds that are just made of purely refined warp stone, able to puncture through the thickest of armor. These are beloved by Skaven political figures for cleanly taking out their rivals. Their range and power makes them ideal for sniping out important characters, and just the sheer way they're designed and made up makes them the slightest of the weapons teams, which we'll talk about more here in a bit. And this unit is a favorite of both clans Eshin and Scryer, both for the stealth and also the technological advances that it took to achieve. And just like the Dezales, the rest of the units we're going to talk about now are weapon teams. See, Scryer turns out more weapons than they could ever use. 
so they're often sold off to the highest bidder, and as such, these two-man weapon platforms are plentiful across the entire Skaven race. And again, I want to reiterate, there's not much lore about them individually, but understand that they are highly refined weapons of war, which always seems to end at some point in the detonation of the user, meaning you just blow up. But, you, know, you might be asking yourself, why would a Skaven ever use this? You feel like a god of war up until that point, right? When you are unleashing hell itself upon the enemy, you feel invincible, and then it just blows up. So there's four of them here. We're going to rapid fire through them pretty quick. First up is the rattling gun, which is notoriously unstable. These are multi-barrel death machines on the front line. It's hand cranked six barrels spin to deliver these warp laced bullets. And when you get a bunch of them unleashing a torrent of bullets, it's a hailstorm and they just tear the enemy to shreds. And the biggest kind of, I guess, failure point when it comes to the rattling gun is overheating. And if you overheat the gun too much, it'll actually detonate the ammunition that you're trying to fire and you'll just blow up as well. Now, this could easily be solved by just stopping for a brief moment and letting the gun cool down and then resuming. But the euphoria of destruction prevents the Skaven from even seeing that as a possibility. They just get into it, cranking the gun really fast, having a blast, laughing, cackling, and feeling invincible until, again, it overheats and they explode. Next up is the Warp Fire Thrower, and this is the Scryer Engineers came up with a new kind of chemical. Remember I told you chemical engineering is a type of engineering that the Warlock Engineers will do. And what this is, is a warp stone soaked concoction that ignites when it hits the air. So what you do is you load up a tank full of this stuff, connect it to a fire hose, and unleash it upon the enemy. And this all together makes a very crude flamethrower. The problem with this amazing weapon of war that is deadly efficient is that it requires you to have a massive jug of explosions sitting next to you at any given time. And while the results are devastating upon the enemy, entire chunks of the Skaven army will suddenly evaporate when a stray round hits that tank. Again, up until the point of explosion, they feel absolutely invincible. Next is the Doom Flare, and think of the Doom Flare as being like a mini Doom Wheel. A little motorized ball of death crewed by a pair of Skaven, where the Doom Wheel has slaves inside actually turning the wheel. This is much more mechanical, but because of the limitations of it, it's much smaller in size. It was originally designed for clearing out caves and tunnels, which I found really, really interesting. There was actually some cool stuff in the Fire Slayer's book about fighting Skaven who got into their tunnels, and I thought this was a perfect kind of mental picture of how do you fight Fire Slayers in tunnels. Imagine one of these rolling towards you in a confined space, it'd be terrifying. Because it really is just a motorized ball covered in swirling and spinning blades that you just chuck at the enemy, and the crew behind it does their best to steer it and kind of mo maintain the momentum and the engine power. But eventually, it'll die, right? The biggest threat here is getting hurt yourself, right, by touching the machine where you shouldn't, or it'll just die if the motor gives out, and all of a sudden, you are just standing a couple of feet away from the front lines of the enemy. And the last unit we're going to talk about today is the Warp Grinder. And this one is also very interesting because it's actually a bit of mining equipment rather than being a full-blown weapon crew. See, its original design was as a tool to make gnaw holes get dug faster. And you can instantly see why cave-ins are a thing by looking at this model. It looks like the worst kind of mining equipment. You don't want to go down a hole that this thing has made. But as for its battlefield use, this is a favorite among many, many clans. You let Skaven tunnel up to the weak parts of an enemy. They can get inside of any fortification, behind the enemy's front lines, get right up in close and personal with their leadership. And I talked a lot about yesterday about why gnaw holes are so unreliable, but this as a tool of war in a particular battle is actually much more reliable because you're going a much shorter distance, which increases the level of accuracy. And you know, it's still, it's still full of danger. Tunnel collapses do happen and you can pop up in the wrong place. But the idea is they can deliver units in the midst of a battle ready for a fight, and that's pretty invaluable. And that's it for the units of the clan's scryer. So let's talk about why are these units and why is this clan cool? 
Truth be told, there's a lot here and a lot of it has to do with aesthetics. The kind of machinery that they build, the way it looks, the very like almost steampunk but ragtag kind of cobbled together things that really don't have any business working but do. It's just a very cool visual. The fact that every one of these things can be overcharged or pushed to the absolute limit in the books and stuff like that where it explodes with disastrous results uh, is incredible and the fact that they translate that to the tabletop with uh, almost every single one of these things has a rule where you can overpower the engines at, at a risk and what i find really funny is that i kind of like it's very meta i lose myself in the moment because just as the skaven in these stories right they feel like these weapons are the ultimate doomsday weapon and there's no reason why this thing would ever blow up in my face the rules of how they translated that to the tabletop, a lot of times it's like roll a die on a two on a, on a one, right? Something bad happens or something like that, where there's a minor chance of it happening, but you as a player feel so awesome about the effect that you don't even like, you don't always see the consequences of it. And so I become the Skaven who's just like, this won't backfire on me. And of course, of course, over multiple rounds, or multiple games, it inevitably will. It will blow up in your face, and it's hilarious when it does, because you are just as foolish as the army that you're trying to portray. So in terms of taking like uh, lore and fluff and all those things and feelings of an army and translating it into rules, I think they nailed it. It's just so stinking funny. Of course, you could be very strict and not use any of those kinds of rules, but I mean, come on, at what point are you just not playing Skaven then? As we'll explore the other clans, they're all sort of merit-based in how that you can achieve things. Like if you want to raise rank within your clan, or if you want your clan to raise, you know, to become a higher stature within the greater clan's scryer, uh, you have to keep inventing new things. And I think that's a really interesting thing. Where in some armies you'll see like dramatic deeds that achieve things. Now having the idea of saying like, you need to be smarter both in terms of survival against your peers, but also just actually smarter, a better scientist, if you will, better engineer than others around you. Just the inclusion of different kinds of intelligence and the way to like navigate their political environment is really, really interesting. Again, they're different kinds of smarts. And we can see the Great Horned Rat's plan to kind of weed out the weaker ones in full effect here. I also like the fact that they seem to work really, really well with other clans in terms of like buying and selling and trading, like their economy makes sense. We produce things that other smaller clans want. And with that money, they can say hire someone from Eshin to steal the blueprints of a new machine from one of their peers or have them assassinated, or they can buy rat ogre babies and make storm fiends. They, they, you can see like their wealth and power base at the home front, even though Pestilence is probably more powerful out across the realms. They're more powerful at home and how they consolidate that power by working with others is really cool. And one thing I will tell you here, and uh, if you have not played uh, some of the actual like Warhammer fantasy battles of video games, uh, Skaven Tide or Warhammer Total War 2, when you get to see the Skaven in action, it is some of the most dynamic visuals out there. When you see a Storm Fiend in action in Vermintide 2, it is breathtaking and horrifying and terrifying all at the same time when you see the little brain rat baby you know on his back flailing around because his body's worthless it is terrifying and then to see the doom wheel in actual motion and how it just chops straight through things is just incredible this is an army that focuses on science but it also that science portrays the very like intangible things of fear right that, that kind of they can project across the enemy I love it. I love that the dark magic fused with kind of mechanical stuff and it's all very macabre. And I remember playing Shadow of the Horned Rat when I was a kid and seeing the Skaven machines in action there. Oh, it was all a great set of memories for me and I absolutely enjoyed every one of them. But with every video, this is the start of a discussion. Tell me your favorite Clan Scryer unit down below. I'd love to talk about it. I already said mine, it's the Doom Wheel, but I want to hear yours. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll come back to you tomorrow with our next Skaven video. Thank you so much for watching, and happy wargaming.